Well, welcome everyone to the next episode of HR Tech Chat. And we have with us today as our guest is Jennifer Ravalli, who is Vice President of Marketing at Panda Logic. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks, Brent. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yeah, yeah. We um, we had an awesome conversation. Um, it's it's crazy to think that it was actually two months ago now, but uh, at a HR Tech Conference, the virtual one in the spring, um, we had a, a fantastic conversation, and you went through a lot of uh, what you folks are doing at Panda Logic, and we and we ended up getting into a if I recall correctly, a, a pretty philosophical conversation, I think around, you know, how AI and machine, machine learning and NLP and all that stuff, right, is uh, really going to affect and have a, have a massive impact on what talent acquisition is like in the, um, in the uh, I'd say now, not too distant future, although it's not tomorrow. Um, some of it's here already, but, yeah. you know, some of it's kind of science fiction, seems science fiction, but um, with, as with so many other things in today's world, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty close to the science fiction at this point. Um, so where would you like to start? Uh, you know, I think really, you know, it's a really interesting discussion. And um, to me, it's all about data fueled change and really seeing that data take shape in talent acquisition overall and in the life of a recruiter. Um, you know, it, I think this is a very similar transition to what you saw in marketing 10 years ago, where things really went from being very gut instinct led to being extremely data driven now. You know, everything from not only where you advertise or how you seek out the right uh, client profile, but even, you know, the creative process has gone very much to kind of a data driven model. And I think you're seeing the same thing happen in the talent acquisition space today. Um, and really a lot of early adopters have taken to this very well in terms of bringing AI, uh, natural language processing and machine learning into their recruitment process. Um, but there's still a lot of ways to go in terms of adoption there. Um, and I think a lot of that really comes from fear and you know, kind of a fear of loss of control kind of mm -hmm. with kind of having data kind of take you to those places. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of that's gonna start to change very quickly, particularly with kind of job ad recovery on the rise. Um, and you know, what's really also very interesting now is you know, we're seeing that you know, jobs are picking up, but people are having a really hard time getting the talent they need right now. Um, and, you know, a lot of that has to do with, you know, certainly dynamics, um, you know, fear of change for the job seeker, uh, as well as um, just being able to, you know, think about, you know, whether they want to take the risk at this point, you know, given kind of where we are. Um, but I think it's really hitting a, prep, a, a pivot point where people need more data, they need more AI and machine learning fueled tools in order to get to that talent that they really need to kind of bring to the table. Um, so it's it's very interesting time right now, but I think that transition point is really starting to happen. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the data that's now available and the ability to be able to take that and learn from it on an ongoing basis. I can't imagine having to um, uh, handle or, or adjust to uh, the coming tsunami of job applications if we were in the 70s right now, right? I mean, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's always my reference point is, you know, is what was it like in the 70s versus now, right? And that's where you get your real contrast is, I mean, AI, can you give us, um, th there's so much in what you just shared. I have several questions. I don't want to mm -hmm. forget them as we talk about the things and, you know, in order here, but, um, but what I'd love to, what I'm curious about right now uh, first is, can you give us an example of how the AI, well, I'm just going to go off on a, on a super mini rant right now. Sure. A rant, just an aside, you know, AI is often used as kind of an umbrella term for some things that aren't necessarily AI, but, but mm -hmm. are very sophisticated and useful. For instance, machine learning, uh, natural language processing, this, you know, and then, and then you have, you know, real like artificial intelligence and some of this stuff is kind of lower level, but it's still very sophisticated. So with that in mind, 
with these newfangled, you know, more far more sophisticated computing capabilities, uh, how is that? How is that helping right now? Sure. Um, so I'm trying to think of a really good example. Um, how we can really think about? I'm going to use sourcing actually as an example. Okay. Um, you know, most recruiters make decisions kind of, hey, like. I know based on my prior experience that this job is hard to fill or easy to fill. You know, is it something I should advertise or is it something I can do on my own? Uh, and if not, they kind of have preferential places that they may want to place those ads. Um, and this is definitely a very personal example kind of given what we do, but I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about. Um, but that series of decisions that that recruiter or sourcer makes has a huge impact on the outcome. Um, and often they're very fraught with bias and use a fairly limited scope of data. Um, when we introduce AI into that equation, we can really streamline those decisions. You know, the application of AI is really around the decision-making of being able to kind of change on a dime, make those decisions very quickly and leverage that data that it's learning from to be able to continue to change and adapt that reasoning. Uh, so when we introduce that AI into the equation, we can streamline and we can also make those decisions much faster and on a much larger scale. So if we were to evaluate those jobs at PandaLogic, um, we would look at them. We do something called a predictive performance report, um, which basically before we ever spend a dime, we say based on all of our data of over 10 years of being in the programmatic market, supply and demand, et cetera, we're actually pulling in all of that data to say, actually, this job is much harder to fill than this one. So here's where you should place your dollars. And you need to be placing it in a variety of places in order to be able to get to those, those candidates and meet them where they are. And you know what's very interesting is while most of the time folks would you know, advertise maybe in three or four places, we have over a thousand places that we're placing those jobs based on where we see that talent residing and based on real-time data that we're making a decision to place an ad, remove an ad, or actually um, impact the cost in order to be able to get that best outcome. And so when we apply that philosophy, we're able to actually save around 30% of what they would invest normally in order to get that candidate. So those are some of the real life applications of AI that can really see tremendous results and also help to attract a larger scope of candidates than maybe that recruiter's individual decisions might make on their own. That's really interesting. And, and so a couple of things. So A, I mean, we're, we're talking about a fundamental, well, let me, let me back up a little bit here. So you look at recruiting as a profession, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, a recruiting professional, a really good recruiting professional, you know, they've sort of developed uh, for lack of a better term, just to keep to keep this moving right now, a sixth sense, mm -hmm. you know, or, or or kind of like just a just an intuition or a um, just a, a or we could even say just sort of a uh, a fine understanding of the the types of roles that they work with and the company that they work for, right? And so they kind of, they've developed this over time, and and. And some recruiters perform better than others. And you could argue that that might be one of the reasons, right? But what you're talking about is, is kind of a, um, this is a strong word and, and I'll use it anyway. It's kind of a usurpation of that, right? It's, it's, so you have a recruiter that has an intuition for, or, or believes very strongly that they have an intuition for what is needed to fill a certain role. And you could apply, I, I mean, the royal you, you could apply AI mm -hmm. to that, right? And come up with a completely different conclusion. And, and this is where, this is where you're kind of changing, you know, th this is where the recruiting, I think maybe loses uh, some of, some of its, um, some of the art of it, right? Okay, so so so, how do you see recruiting the profession of recruiting evolving 
to to adapt to to live side by side with this AI, uh, because some of the what you're talking about that was the word I was looking for is the art of the art of recruiting. It's it, it, was there an art in the first place, right? Or was it just kind of a uh, you know a uh, just did the recruiter think there was an art to it, but maybe there wasn't. Um, do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, it, I'm, yeah, I'm a huge believer in the balance of art and science, um, particularly yeah. coming from a marketing background. Um, yeah. You know, certainly like my ability to craft messaging, to be able to get to that right person at the right time, you know, is a lot of art, but then validated by science, right? And I think that that's where we're going to see recruiting go as well. Um, you know, you still need instinct when it comes to talking to that candidate, and being able to, you know, place that right um, person that's going to be a true cultural add to the organization. But when we think of a lot of the work that AI should be doing at times or could be doing for mm -hmm. them, it's often in the places where it's more areas where they may not want to be spending a lot of their time. Okay. Um, and I think that's, and I think that's a, a big difference. I think there's a fear of AI that it's going to take away jobs and being able to, you know, kind of to replace people, um, but that's really not um, kind of where I believe AI is going. It really should be more of a companion, you know, similar in marketing, there are different roles now, you focus on different things than maybe you did 10 years ago when you didn't have AI to help you. Um, but when you think about having that AI, particularly let's say at the front end of the process, um, it allows you to really have that recruiter focus on what is truly that more human mission. Um, which is, you know, once you kind of start to get that initial field of candidates, making sure that you're, you know, getting the, the right person in the role, having a really strong candidate experience um, to support that, you know, it's interesting, we as talent acquisition, as a group, right, the royal we of the industry, uh, yeah. talk a lot about candidate experience and, you know, different loops and things of that nature. But when we're actually doing some work now around kind of job seekers and how they're really feeling and their, their sentiment and, you know, there's some more really great stuff to come, but like high level, like they don't see it the same way we do. And if we were to think about where a recruiter can spend their time, it's really honing in on providing that, you know, support to the candidate, making that candidate experience really personalized and, and bringing them through for both the hiring manager and the candidate versus some of this work that kind of drives the initial kind of pool. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, also in thinking about, you know, driving more diversity into the workforce, you know, if you don't source for that in the first place, like you're not going to end up with a, a clean slate of candidates that, you know, may represent a really diverse population, you know, and, and technology can really help eliminate bias in that area. So I think it's, it's really should be about working hand in hand yeah. and being able to take the benefit of the AI uh, on the front end but then take that magic that the recruiter brings to the table, that art, that gut, that instinct to really put that perfect person in the hands uh, and deliver them safely to the hiring manager to really impact the business. Yeah, oh, I love that. You know, it, 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 because that's what it comes down to, you know, that there's a need for a, um, a, a, a human interaction there for, for, for the business, um, task at hand to feel um, satisfying to the to all the stakeholders involved so there's that human that human interaction that I think that is necessary and so so what you just described source I mean this is going to make source sourcing folks who focus on sourcing as their role this is going to make them um, very very efficient um, and and it has occurred to me that that you're what you're describing is uh, essentially uh, we'll just use the word automation because there's, there's really kind of I think a different word for it I've heard it uh, mm -hmm. as pros uh, there, there's terms for it that I've heard that are escaping me at the moment <laughs> something around process but we're talking about the automation of much higher much more complex processes than you know we have automation of you know like payroll processing and other things it's that's very essentially lower level automation, we've almost, you know, completely won the game when it comes to that lower level automation. You know, not everybody has the tools, but the tools that can do it exist. 
right? Uh, whereas what you're talking about is, is again, I'm using automating as a, as a placeholder term here, but you're talking about automating much higher level, more sophisticated, complex processes, workflows. Um, in, in the decision-making is the other thing that, that, that I wanted to make sure that we hit on here uh, that, that really struck me. Uh, you're, you're improving or assisting or, or um, uh, neither of those is necessarily the, necessarily the right word here either, but, but you're, 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 you're enhancing the decision-making uh, that they would make um, to make it more accurate or more uh, applicable or pertinent, make, the, make the, the, the result more pertinent. And that is, um, that's something that, that's occurred to me previously in, in my own writings uh, on the blog at 360 Insights is this idea that AI is, well, we talk about human decision-making. Let's look at, because I want to get into job descriptions too, because I, I, we had, we talked a lot about that, but let's, okay, I'm a human, all right, I write my own CV, or, or maybe I hire someone else to, to write it for me, or to provide heavy input into my own writing of my CV, right? It's humans evolved, you know, it's our best guess, uh, sort of an analog for, for pure objectivity in terms of understanding of my own career. I mean, I have an opinion, a bias about my own career. It doesn't even have to be, um, uh, it doesn't even have to be in, for anybody, that, that opinion, that bias doesn't have to be uh, particularly arrogant or, or anything like that. It's just a bias. I, I look back on my career, and from my perspective, I think that A, B, and C is, are relevant and X, Y, Z might not be as relevant, right? And again, I'm also furthermore, I'm looking at my credentials I'm, and sort of my experience and my expertise versus not necessarily, you know, recognizing my soft skills or, or talking about those in my, in my CV. So, the, so my CV is just, is just, um, uh, wrought with you know just these these biases and I, I don't want to say in, inaccuracies because that's not the word but these biases are these this information that may not be relevant to the role that is open right and then when I'm an organization writing a job description um, it's kind of the same thing as an organization I think I have an idea uh, that I may be very emotionally attached to that I think this particular open role needs, right? And that may not, that, you know, it's really a shot in the dark. Well, it's a little bit better than a shot in the dark, but it's, it's certainly not nowhere near as accurate or as, excuse me, as objective as an AI would be in sort of looking at the data, right? If you have a large enough data set, sorry, I'm ranting here, but this, I love this topic. It's just, that AI with a large enough data set, set of set of data around that particular kind of role would be able to develop or provide heavy input into the development of a job description that would, you know, ultimately be much more objective and relevant to the actual needs for that role for that organization. So you're so we have two things. We have the CV that's that's maybe irrelevant. It may be you know, it's not inaccurate, but it's irrelevant, right? potentially very much so the same thing for the job description so we're sort of the line the blind leading the blind and that's what we've been doing forever right and it's not that we've we, we certainly haven't failed because we have hired people you know i'm talking in aggregate in all of industry over decades of time we've hired plenty of people that did a great job and plenty of people didn't do a great job it's been you know that's just been the the reality of it now we're talking about potentially completely different scenario. So <laughs> with that backdrop, and I'm, I'm sorry, I think I went on too long there, but, but uh, let's talk about job descriptions for a moment here. I, or wh what's your reaction to that? I'm super excited to talk about this. I had like a million thoughts coming through my mind as, we, awesome. as you were sharing. Um, so first of all, I think the resume angle is really interesting because I don't think anybody has even has even thought to solve that yet. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. You know, I know personally I was thinking about myself and, you know, when I look at my uh, CV, you know, how do I look at it? And what I always find is I downplay a lot of things that I've done. Right. Which is a very female trait. 
Mm -hmm. um, oh, can I really take credit for that? Was that really my work? Um, and I actually, in, in one point when I was interviewing for a job years ago, you know, I used a lot of we and the, the hiring manager, who's actually probably my um, biggest sponsor um, overall in my career was like, well, you used we a lot. Like, tell me what you did specifically. And I'm like, you know, these are all things that I led. And yet I am almost making them less, you know, granted, that means that I support the fact that I work with a team and that, you know, we don't get work done entirely on our own. But, you know, really, you see that very much come through, particularly when you look at the difference in how women create resumes and how men create resumes and also how they respond to job descriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, so those two things really do, do go hand in hand. Um, one interesting thing in particular, when we think about the, the use of AI in recruiting and, and I think NLP as well is um, really when we say throw away the resume and when we start mm -hmm. to do things through conversational AI to get people to talk about themselves in different ways than they may have if they were simply putting together a resume and thinking about their accomplishments, their achievements and their, and their credentials. Um, but really talking about what they did, what lights them up and what excites them about what they're looking to do next. Uh, so I think that there's some really interesting work to be done, particularly on the resume. Um, but, you know, there's some certainly some movement using conversational AI, not that it's perfect yet, but um, I think it helps. And then as we think about how we store that information and, you know, maybe a little bit crazy. And as we've thought about, you know, kind of very much into the future, uh, how that mess, how that information that we're sharing through those avenues becomes more of a profile for mm -hmm. the job seeker and how they can kind of move forward in their careers using the things that they've shared when they're not sharing them and to be on a piece of paper, but in having conversation. Uh, so I think that there's a lot to be done there and, and who, maybe that's, maybe that's my next job is creating a company <laughs> that does that, but <laughs> I'm going to found that company before you, all right? So <laughs> I just realized I, I let the cat out of the bag here. Um, yeah, great stuff. So, you know, the Velocity Network Foundation does some stuff around this. And, and, um, and, uh, it, and wouldn't it be interesting, you know, now we're, we're talking far out stuff, but I, I it, it, you know, I could see it happening. Is you had a, maybe, maybe each, each individual, you know, in an increasingly gig economy, gig-like economy in the future, right? Um, and, and we, that's a whole rabbit hole that we'll get into right now because we don't have enough time, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's a day-long conversation. But you have individuals in the future who have an AI assistant or a, or a, or a um, companion, you could call it an AI companion that Maybe that's a little creepy, but we'll say an AI assistant or you know, or an AI prosthetic, right? That that helps them. They're they're working so many gigs, so many projects at such a high velocity, just from one project to the next, right? And you have the AI that's that's um that's uh, discerning, determining who's best for the next projects, right? And and so you have as an individual, you have an AI program that's that's constantly recompiling your background. To present to the to the um, to the project in need your potential you know your potential relevance for that project right and 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 that's something that you know it, at some point it, look ten not ten years ago about uh, eight years ago um, I transitioned myself I transitioned from being um, a consultant I was con doing contract work with all sorts of people uh, to uh, one of the vendors, the large vendors in the space, basically gave me an offer that I could not refuse um, in a good way, not in the godfather way. But anyway, and so I had to compile my CV. I had to go back and all these projects and figure out, and it had to be, they, they wanted something kind of exhaustive. And, and, then, and then, of course, the, um, the, uh, the, the background check was 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 abs was an absolute. I mean, that was, wow. was I don't want to say nightmare because it was it was all positive. I, I was hired and all that, but but that was a real crazy process going through the background screening uh, as well, right? Because I had to go back and figure out all this stuff that I hadn't uh, thought to keep track of at the time because I never thought it was going to be relevant. And so I'm glossing over it a little bit, but the whole point is that it would have been nice also to have had a blockchain kind of just 
pull it all in track of all of that mm -hmm. too so so the future i think you know and, and i was sort of inferring from something you said previously just a moment ago uh was inferring blockchain i didn't know if that's maybe what you meant but yeah blockchain and ai i think it's going to be huge and maybe this is what what role do you think this this um i wasn't expecting to that we'd get into this today but but um uh psychometrics what do you what role do you think those will play um in this sort of hypothetical not so hypothetical future yeah i mean that's really interesting i think um we're seeing a lot of that and i think this will also apply very much when it comes to behavior and the job and in reacting to you know i want to make sure we get to job descriptions as well but um yeah. the when you look at behavior and it was funny we were meeting with someone and as we were showing them our platform you know, one of the things that we do is extrapolate thing, extrapolate job descriptions into more common language using specific variables. And what that then shows is the behavior of an applicant and what they respond to and what they don't, right? And when we think about bringing behavior into evaluation for a job and things of that nature, you know, I think that there's there's been a lot of work there. And I think some folks have, have bought in and, and some folks have not. But there's, we look at that from a marketing perspective with such detail in terms of, you know, if, if you can get to psychometrics in being able to build a profile of your uh, customer, you know, this is very relevant in healthcare. When you mm -hmm. think of, you know, particularly people who are, you know, more advent to take risks versus others, right? And being able to then build that profile using, using data and using the AI to build that, you're able to make really much better decisions about the placement of those um, those potential uh, those potential um, employers or or members yeah. that you're bringing into per se a health plan, right? Yeah. So very similarly, you know, when we think about people who are taking risks, who are willing to take risks in a job, you know, whether or not they make sense in a startup environment versus a more stable environment, like these are all really great tools to be able to add to kind of look at the value of, of the, um, the, well, I would say, I hate to say fit of a position because I really think you should always look at candidates as how are they going to add to your organization mm -hmm. versus fit in your organization, um, mm -hmm. but really kind of profiling out and understanding how that person is going to add value in terms of the way that they make decisions and the way that they behave in certain scenarios. Um, and I think that there's there's a lot of work being done in that area, um, but I'm not necessarily seeing a lot of people pick that up in terms of, it, except maybe potentially towards the end of a process, you know, when it's mm -hmm. down to kind of two specific candidates and trying to kind of make a decision between them. Um, but I think we can do a lot there probably in the future in terms of as we build those and curate those profiles um whether you know through kind of you know the the language that they're providing and then attaching that through blockchain um or you know or as well as through kind of assessments and things later on in the process yeah all, all great stuff and you know what again that goes back to what something you were saying earlier around i think that you said you said quote i think that we can uh, i'm paraphrasing <laughs> i think that we can apply ai to the front end of the process in recruiting to really help help the recruiter be more effective uh, farther further down the stream um applying those psychometrics as opposed to you know once you've got it whittled it down to two employees right uh, potential new hires um applying that at the outset earlier everybody right yeah a lot of earlier mm -hmm. let's talk about job descriptions um what what how are job descriptions you know what what's the state of job descriptions today what what what's the, what are the challenges what what do we need to do and and how can ai help yeah so i think we can all agree that job descriptions are generally pretty awful uh, <laughs> um, yeah. you know we are they're, actually they're, they're depressing to read i mean you, know, <laughs> you, you read them and you're like oh <laughs> I, don't, I know I'm not right for this, so, you know, <laughs> it, which is often the, the the wrong conclusion to make. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we actually had a great meeting um, with a company yesterday um, 
and that and I can think it's okay if I mention them, Brent. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so it's get optimal, and um, they're doing some really fantastic work in this area. Um, but like a tidbit they shared with us that I I knew but was this outstanding is over fifty percent of every job description is plagiarized. So basically, every time somebody is looking to kind of create a new job description, what are they doing? They're searching on the internet for similar ones, you know, bringing together pieces of the things they like versus what they don't and, and building that job description. Um, in addition, many companies think that they need to hire unicorns instead of salespeople, right? So, you know, there may be, they're going to give interesting titles um you know in terms of like you know things like value engineer versus like a you know solution consultant or something of that nature that is more common mm -hmm. and you know and and what we find is when we when we ingest those job descriptions um you know we find we take about 68 different um variables within a job description and evaluate that to see how we can make that more responsive through seo and you know, through kind of the the placement. And what we find is when we eliminate all the jargon, mm -hmm. the job description performs much better and people actually apply for it, right? So it's not the unicorn, it's, you know, we're actually looking for a salesperson, but it's a salesperson for a tech company and not Walmart, right? And being able to make that distinction. Uh, and sometimes the way job descriptions are written, it isn't that easy to actually tell the difference. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, so it's it's really important, I think, to that. But then the other part of it is really the bias of who applies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of great work going on in this area. Um, and it's but like six women will not apply for a job unless they feel like they are 100 percent hitting every single area on that job description, mm -hmm. whereas men will apply when they feel like they're 60% ready. Hmm. I'm ready enough, I'm going to take that step. A lot of that is about the construction of the job description, you know, too long, too many bolded requirements, and the language that's in that job description, and that it can go more masculine, more feminine, it may actually, you know, completely, completely um, not at all have any impact on a woman who will say, I don't want that job at all. Mm -hmm. um, just given maybe a couple of words within there. So there's a lot of room for change. And it's exciting to see vendors who are coming to the table and taking the data that is, that's, a, that's available to be able to say, this needs to be less biased language you know, we need to remove kind of gendered language from here. And then we also need to think about streamlining this description so that more people will apply. Uh, and it's amazing to see the behavior applied to that when you actually put that into the market and you can see the changes and how people respond to them. Sorry, I'm getting excited there. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Really because and I'm looking at the time. We we do need to sort of land the plane here, but and and, and I knew this conversation would go this way. I knew that we'd run out of time, <laughs> but but you you're talking about DNI. I mean, this you know you know so there, there's all sorts of ways that an organization can uh, equip itself to 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 um, be better at DNI, right? Mm -hmm. And and one of those, excuse me, it's D, D, E, and I now, excuse me. But, but one of those ways is, excuse me, a number of these ways may not have been readily apparent at first blush, but one way is to apply AI to your job description writing process, right? You, you, right there. Um, it's interesting. And, and I have heard these, these statistics before that, that you shared in it. And it's very interesting, you know, um, you know, that that is you know how do you solve for that well part of that is changing how the job description is written also part of it is just you know is just um changing um uh, attitudes or helping helping women to to think you know a little bit more you know to, to realize that, that you can apply for a job even if you're not 100 percent qualified but but we're getting back to some of that sort of um sort of authoritarian language that comes out of job descriptions in general. And, you know, what, whether or not it's um, necessarily helping uh, any one group to be more represented, it's even if you just think about the fact, hey, let's make our job descriptions sound less authoritarian. I mean, that, that in and of itself is, is a, that sounds great to me. I think that would sound great to anybody. 
right? So that's another way of looking at it. Yeah, you know, it definitely is. But I think it's also like, okay, so I want to make my job description more friendly, less authoritarian. But I don't necessarily know based on my own judgment that if I say I'm looking for a person someone who's a risk taker like that that's going to take 50 percent of the population and say no no thanks i need something really stable and <laughs> you know, like that's this. most yeah. important to me right now right uh and you know when you introduce ai and where you've seen people take action or not into the equation you can look out for some of those things that are just not so easily identifiable and really be able to make a step forward in that you know yesterday we had our um our, our Global Executive Advisory Council um, Symposium. Um, and we had a few folks online and we had a few presentations and some uh, interactive free uh, uh, open forums. And one of the presentations yesterday was around neurodiversity. And this idea of, you know, we're, the world is built around a sort of the neurotypical way of thinking. Um, this, this gets beyond, you know, gender and all of that. It's just, you know, we're talking about, you know, people on the spectrum that I, they don't call it Asperger's anymore, but you, but you have, you know, autism light, I guess would be called Asperger's and then, and then other people that are farther along the spectrum. But these are, these are neuro, you could call them neuro atypical, but, but it's the idea that there, there's a neuro diversity there. And, and you look at, there, there's an, an analogy here. So, or a, a parallel thing here, right? You look at, you just Google the term leadership and all this stuff comes up, right? And in a, you know, your typical person with who's on the spectrum isn't necessarily going to be a leader in an organization, but when you use leadership type language in say a job description, um, you may be dissuading people who would possibly be very good to have on your team for specific tasks, like really good uh, from, from even applying. Like there's, there, I, I don't have it in front of me, but there's data out there that says, you know, that if you have, they're actually, excuse me, it was um, uh, SAP the, a while back. They did a, they actually decided to, uh, with some intentionality there, they intentionally built some teams that had some neurodiverse people and people on the spectrum. And they found that those teams actually uh, uh, performed 30% better because some of these neurodiverse folks are really, really good at focusing on a task and solving for problems. And, and so if you don't have them on your team, you you may actually be screwing yourself, you know? So you, uh, so you need to, so there's all sorts of people that, that you dissuade from joining your company uh, and you inadvertently do this through the language you're using. And if you apply AI to that, to that, um, to that challenge, you may find yourself attracting talent that's going to make you better. Absolutely. And, you know, I really think, and I look at that as um, inclusion, right? Yeah. You know, they, they talk about like diversity can be seen, but inclusion is felt. Yeah. And when we think about diversity, there's so many dimensions to it. And, you know, when we think about folks who are disabled as well, like they don't necessarily disclose that. Someone may not disclose that they're neurodiverse. They just may keep that to themselves and, you know, then not apply. Uh, and when you think about how you take all of those dimensions of diversity and apply them to a team, you get such a better outcome. And that's really where, you know, you know one thing that, you know, I've talked a lot about with some practitioners is, thinking about, you know, everybody has the question, is this a cultural fit? When we really always need to be asking instead, what is a cultural, is this a cultural ad? And, yeah. you know, as we think about that, that allows us to open up folks to have different perspectives, different backgrounds um, mm -hmm. that may not necessarily be like exactly what we were expecting to be the perfect person for that role. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's amazing when we think about how we can <clears throat> take data to be able to help us understand what those nuances are and then really kind of drive home, bringing a truly um, a workforce that's gonna deliver the results and deliver the types of organizations that we all wanna work for. Yeah, and, and what you just described is sort of a, a microcosm of this idea that, that we have our own sort of uh, subjective ideas of what's going to work. And it's, it's not that we're, we're purposely being subjective. It's just, we have our limitations as, as humans, right? And, 
to be able to apply AI to the process to, to get to more of an objective uh, conclusion that may be more relevant to the uh, to the future of the organization is is uh, is always a good thing. Um, we are we do need to conclude our conversation. This has been fantastic. Um, you know, we should do this again sometime. I would love that. I really had a great time today, and thank you so much for having me, Brent. Oh, absolutely. It's, it, it is our pleasure. Thank you so much, Jen. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.